Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today, we will be discussing leadership programs for Latino youth that prepare them for successful futures with our special guest, Santiago Marquez, CEO of the Latin American Association in Atlanta, Georgia, Patricia Barahona, uh, CEO of Youth Leadership Institute in San Francisco, and Carmen Diaz Malvido, CEO of Aspira of New York. So just to set this up, the experience of being a, a young Latino in America is very unique, and uh, there are often many uh, challenges uh, in these young people's lives, language barriers, the immigration system, uh, other challenges of being first-generation students, or being part of a multi-generational family in a society where uh, um, acceptance is not necessarily always guaranteed. So let's talk about each of your organization's unique programs for Latino youth. And I'm going to start off with uh, Patty. Um, would you mind uh, giving us sort of the the um, the picture from your um, your vantage point at the Youth Leadership Institute? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me, Mark. I'm really excited to be here alongside Carmen and Santiago. Um, you know, Youth Leadership Institute is an organization that develops young leaders across the state of California. Um, we do uh, four key things. One is that we see the assets that young people bring to the space as Latino young people, as young people of color. Uh, we see those lived experience as assets in our community. Uh, we then base and help them think about the issues that, that affect them through research and data gathering. Uh, they then tell their stories in their communities, and then they lead policy campaigns at the local, city, countywide level. Um, we're excited to do that work and really help support and invest and center the voices of young people across the state. So why is it so important to have a, an organization like yours, right? I mean, if, if you look at uh, uh, America and American youth, right, everybody comes from someplace. Why is it important to have an organization like yours, particularly serving Latino youth? Yeah, I think that um, YLI is really important for a number of reasons. I would say um, one of the most significant is that young people are not just recipient of services. Young people um, are actors, right? They are um, actually advocating. They have voices. They have lived experiences. They have knowledge to share um, to actually shape and unpack the systemic barriers that they face every day. So they absolutely have to be at the center of creating change. Um, and we know that uh, Latino young people are diverse. Um, they come from all kinds of different um, experiences and spaces. And those that are closest to the challenges have to be closest to solving the problems. So at YLI, we want to make sure to center young people in that way. So you're providing a, a platform for voice. You're uh, providing an ability to um, have others support these youth. And you're also preparing the leaders of the future. So Carmen, you um, were that student, right? Definitely. Uh, you know, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for having me here and Patti. Uh, as uh, Mark said earlier, my name is Carmen Diaz Malvido. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Aspeed of New York. Uh, and I definitely am a student who benefited from Aspeed of New York as a leadership uh, as a leadership student. And so coming full circle, having gone through the process of really building my toolkit as a 14 year old in terms of knowing my voice, knowing that it's okay to advocate and to, um, to be part of that change, as Bati said, you know, uh, was, was a gift. Um, and a gift that I continue to use even now as an executive. Uh, a Speed of New York has a legacy of 60 years. Uh, we were founded by Dr. Antonia Pantoja back in 1961. She was uh, an educator, a social worker, a civil rights leader. And we continue to this day to foster the social advancement of Puerto Rican and Latino youth through education and leadership development, advocacy and service learning are key components to the work that we do. Uh, we have a AAA process of awareness, analysis and action. And I think that is critical, you know, it was critical then and it's still critical now, um, really allowing young people to 
really be able to analyze the circumstances that are happening in their life and not just kind of be sitting on the side until they're 18 and then can actually have a say, but actually be part of those discussions. Um, so, you know, I definitely am a huge supporter of leadership initiatives um, and just really giving our young people the voice and, you know, as Patti said, the space to really um, dictate the outcome of their future. And Santiago, you know, um, when, when we think of Georgia, the first thing we think of is not necessarily uh, as a vital center of, uh, of Latino culture, but it is a very large community, uh, isn't it, throughout Georgia and particularly centered in Atlanta? Correct. Yeah. And thank you for having me again. It's an honor to be here with you guys and certainly love uh, both, uh, you know, both the Youth Leadership Institute and ASPIDA have known them for many years and uh, consider myself fortunate to be here with you, with all of you. Absolutely. Look, Georgia, uh, the, the exciting thing about Georgia is right now it has about a million Latino residents, probably more, you know, that haven't been counted. Uh, it is a young population, especially in the metro Atlanta area, right? So what makes it really exciting is if you look at the numbers in the metro Atlanta area, you're looking at about 65% of the Latinos are 35 years and younger. And so there's a lot of energy around politics, business, entrepreneurship, and Georgia's on the map, right? You know, it's the reason that President Biden was here two weeks ago, came to Gwinnett County. Um, it's the reason why next year, it's gonna be a big focal point, you know, in the election next year, because we have a gubernatorial race and one of our senators is up for, uh, for elections. So uh, what we're noticing about the Latino community in Georgia is it's now starting to get to that second generation, right? And actually this morning I drove from Atlanta up here to Dalton, Georgia, which is Northwest Georgia. 45% of the city uh, of Dalton is Hispanic. Yeah. And it's mostly first generation. It's now starting again to have that second generation of Latinos. Dalton State College is the only Hispanic serving institute uh, in the state of Georgia, right? So uh, it's not just Atlanta, you know, it's, it's, it's happening in cities all over Georgia. Uh, but yes, Georgia is, 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 it's a very exciting place because of, of the demographics of Latinos here. Can we talk about a little bit about um, the place of Latinos in America and in particular the history of the development of the country, but through a Latino uh, lens, right? If you take a look at the United States writ large, um, the role of Latinos uh, in this country, in the development of this country, um, is, is really phenomenally important. So can, can, can we just talk a little bit about um, how that came to be? through the, um, the, um, the exploration of uh, Spanish explorers, uh, through the various uh, waves of immigration, through people who were uh, born in this country and have been here for hundreds of years and people who are coming to this country. Um, who would like to take on that, that uh, sort of topic? Because there's a lot of discussion about what constitutes an American and what constitutes um, uh, uh, diversity in this country. Um, let's talk a little bit about the reality behind um, the Latino presence and contributions to the United States. Carmen, could you could you give it a shot uh, initially, and then we'll go around to uh, Patty and to Santiago. Sure. I mean, I you know it's hard to um, distinguish between you know. Uh, being an American and being a Latina in the United States, because it, it, it just is, you know, we, uh, we've grown up here, we're part of the education system, we're living here, this is our, our, our experience, it's a shared experience. Yes, are there uh, nuances and distinctions in being a Latina uh, in, you know, and having that cultural richness? Yes, it is. But um, 
it, it all becomes a part of the same fabric. Um, and so for us, just in terms of even contributions as an organization, you know, uh, Aspira of New York took on the Department of Education back in the early 60s uh, in order for there to be bilingual education with our consent decree. We won. That is the reason why there is bilingual education uh, in our educational system in New York City, uh, because it, it was advocates who were looking at the um, at the migration from Puerto Rico into the United States and knowing that there was there were disparities and, and, and areas that needed to be enhanced. And so, you know, it is part of, uh, of the Americanness of the Latino experience. And, and if you look at the waves of immigration uh, into the United States, right? You have um, a, 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 a British wave, you have a German wave, you have Italian waves, and throughout these, these various successive waves, there have always been a huge, um, a huge presence of Latino citizens. And then you have integrated into these various waves, you also have waves of immigration from, um, from Latin America and, and from other parts of Europe. Patty, how do you see this, uh, th th this massive question of, of the Latino contribution to the identity of the nation? Yeah, I, I don't know that we'd have enough time to talk about all the contributions that Latinos have made um, um, in our country. And I, I think back to sort of Carmen's point here on sort of the fabric, the fabric is, is, is a multitude of colors, right? And the fabric is a, a multitude of experiences. And um, I think and right now- origins, right? I mean, you, you yeah. know, there are all these different yeah. uh, peoples and cultures and subcultures who are part of this fabric, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think Latinos are at the center of sort of the social economic um, context and really, I, I think in many ways, um, have been doing um, so much of the underpinning of the work that makes um, the US incredibly successful. Um, and uh, one of those things um, for me is really thinking about how do we um, move the needle on access to power that mirrors the contributions um, that Latinos have made, um, right? How do we ensure that um, those that are representing us look like us, sound like us, have experiences like us? And we're, we're at that point in time where I think our social, economic, political power has grown tremendously. And I think we have a huge opportunity ahead of us um, to really shift power um, and, and to make sure that culture um, and our communities are at the center of that power. Santiago, um, in, in looking at the picture in Georgia, you talked about the uh, very uh, strong uh, Latino community. Is it, is it Latino community or is it Latino communities? What is the composition of, of the folks that are spread across the Georgia landscape? Right, yeah, thank you. So I think, a couple, well, before, in great, great question, but before I get there, I do want to mention one thing. I think that if we were in our countries of origin, chances are we would not be thinking of ourselves as Latinos, right? We think of ourselves as Latinos, Latinx, Hispanics, in diaspora, right? And, and one thing that the, a good friend of mine, the Consul General of Mexico here um, said one time that really opened my eyes and I share with people is he said, when I talk to Mexicans, I look at them and I say, you know, you're a Georgian. And, and they look at me like I'm crazy, he said. And he, he said to them, no, you have a job in Georgia. You're raising your families in Georgia. You're paying taxes in Georgia. You're buying a house in Georgia. Whether you like it or not, you're a Georgian. Now, continue with your Mexican culture. I mean, you're Mexicano, but right now you're living in Georgia and you're a Georgian and you need to think that way. So um, after he told me that, <laughs> my mindset changed. And I've been in Georgia since 1982. Um, I started thinking of myself as a Georgian, as being fully invested in Georgia, continuing to have my Cuban roots, right? Um, so look, I think that in Georgia, we have 65% of our, of our Latinos are Mexican, of Mexican descent. Uh, very strong, you can see it all over. Growing Colombian, growing Venezuela the growing Puerto Rican uh, communities in a growing Central American community, right? Small uh, Cuban community that has been here since like the 60s. 
uh, but really it's the Mexican community that dominates here in Georgia, you know, and uh, it's interesting because as you go to different places in Georgia, you'll see different communities. So if you go to the coast, Savannah, you see a very strong Puerto Rican community that has moved in from Florida, uh, came right from Puerto Rico, especially a few years ago. Um, you know, if you go to Metro Atlanta, obviously you're gonna, like any big city, you're gonna see a diverse range, right? But you're gonna see predominantly Mexicano uh, uh, is, and still first generation, right? Starting to go into that second generation. But I, in terms of the fabric of, uh, you know, I think that uh, the United States, to your point, is a country that was born from uh, immigrants and continues to be fed by immigrants, right? And the question is, how do you see your identity, right? Um, I see myself as an American who happened to have been born in Cuba, who, you know, has my Cuban roots, continues to consider myself Cubano. I haven't, I haven't ditched that. But I'm an I'm I'm American, right? And and now thanks to the Consul General of Mexico, I look at myself as a Georgian. You know, it's ironic that it took him to get me to see myself that way. So That's, it's a, a lot of it has to do with self-identity, I think. That is that is such an amazing story. We just completed a poll um, which is on this topic. We asked, uh, do you believe that Latinos must assimilate, assimilate to succeed in America? And we had a, a four different answers know that any assimilation would be loss of identity and culture. We had about 10% of respondents um, giving that, that answer. Uh, Latinos can honor their distinctive cultural identities within an American context, 60% agreed with that. And 20% felt that uh, Latinos must assimilate with 10% with, uh, meaning others. So it's, it basically maps to some of what you were saying, uh, Santiago, this, this idea of retaining cultural identity but there are different views. And, and if we talk about um, the services that you provide, let's, let's get a little bit into that because we have, as you've answered this question, we've had uh, mention of people who have just come to this country as new immigrants. We have, had, uh, we have DACA recipients who've grown up here but are not uh, yet citizens. Uh, we have um, uh, people who are citizens but first generation. And then we have uh, second and third generation. So. And then we have um, uh, services to uh, to girls and boys and, and young men and young women. Uh, Carmen, how do you uh, provide your services to uh, to provide the various diverse requirements needs of this very diverse community? Great, thank you. So, I mean, I think just to continue in terms of the the diversity within the Latino community, there is such huge diversity. A Speed of New York was founded with an intent to service Puerto Rican young people back in 1961. Is that still our population? No, our population has expanded. You know, we have Latinos from across the spectrum, South, Central American, the Caribbean, um, but we also have um, a growing group of South Asian students and um, and students from other parts of the globe who who you know who definitely connect with with the Latino community and want to be a part of this. We t we the programs that we provide are leadership development uh, clubs throughout New York City high schools. Um, we provide college access programs, but we have a very robust uh, portfolio of after school programs. You know. Uh, we began just servicing high school students, but we realized we needed to start at an earlier age. We needed to start uh, giving our young people the tools to communicate, to really look at their education, to really look at access starting from the kindergarten uh, age. So we provide after school programs. We run a beacon program, which is a community um, after school program. And we also have community schools uh, throughout the Bronx. Um, so there's a, a variety of services. Uh, we also provide family engagement and adult services because that's needed. Um, we are a, a very social and culturally united uh, community and, um, and it requires us servicing the full family while our focus is youth, uh, we need to be able to also give the skills to mommy, papi, the abuelitos, the tias, the tios, um, who are also part of this, um, this caregiver uh, unit for our young people. And Patty, do you find that, that you're also spilling into, I mean, your, your organization talks about youth leadership, but is this spilling into 
basically a full service type of type of um, of uh, organization that is thinking about the whole family. Uh, your your microphone is not coming on, so we're having we're having some uh, connection issues. Um, uh, Santiago, could you uh, could you jump in while while we sort of figure out uh, Patty's connection issues? Um, sure. Could could you talk a little bit about the the services that you provide to um, uh, girls, uh, women, uh, people who um, have a different orientation, uh, um, uh, 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 boys and and men, and and family? Um, how do you uh, see this? Oh sure, absolutely. So we we have five focus areas, right? And uh, the first one is our family well being and stabilization. That's really, those are our social workers, case managers. Um, we see everything from um, uh, housing insecurity, homeless prevention, uh, food insecurity, domestic violence, Medicare, WIC. I mean, that's really the entry point, right? And from there, we have immigration. Uh, we actually have immigration lawyers in, in, uh, in our building. And uh, I think we're the only Hispanic nonprofit in Georgia that has lawyers that has an immigration focus. Uh, I might most of these services are to people who are in need, who, who have oh, yeah. very limited financial. Uh, it, absolutely, 100%, right? So it, even in our immigration department, the cases that we take are mostly removal defense and petitions. We don't get involved in employment visas or student visas. You know, we really want to focus on the people that, that are really in need. Same thing with family well-being. I mean, we help everybody, but that's our target. We then have a youth services area where we focus on middle school and high school students, really trying to get them to see a pathway to success, which has been very tough during COVID. Um, and then and we have a workforce development uh, piece where we try to help people find jobs. But we have a Latina entrepreneurship program that we have been doing for five years. We learned, we were part of a, a study with Stanford University, studied 500 business owners. And what we realized is that in Georgia, the fastest growth of entrepreneurship resides with Latinas, but Latina businesses are three times smaller than their male counterparts. And Latina businesses are very, not hesitant, I don't wanna use that word, but they're not really plugged into like the chambers of commerce, the civic organizations. The capital that they get is from circles of friends, uh, family. And so we understood very quickly that we had to launch a program to try to help Latina because these are mostly micro businesses. And so uh, now we've launched an incubator where we have eight offices in our building that we rent to Latina business owners that have gone through our, our program. We just opened it because of COVID, right? So COVID restrictions. And they're paying like two or $300 a month. But the goal is to really help them build an ecosystem as they're helping we're helping them build their business. So eventually they could fly the coop, you know, fly the nest and we can get more women in there. And we believe now with the she session, as they're calling it, right? A lot of women have left the workforce. They have found themselves with very little options that we're gonna see a lot more entrepreneurship from Latinas. And so we're excited about that, right? Um, and then we also focus a lot on advocacy. Um, so we do a lot of advocacy work here in Georgia. Patty, is your microphone working again? Let's try this. I think so. Can you hear me? There we go. So, um, Great. I'm so sorry. For you. We just, oh, no, no, no worries. We just uh, completed a, a, um, a question which uh, really focused on whether uh, the respondents felt that nonprofits made a significant difference to this picture or only, um, only made a difference at the margin. And it was about 50-50. Um, do you believe that that um, that your efforts are making a significant difference, and how can we accentuate that difference that uh, we make in the lives of young people um, by how we operate and how we spread out through the community? How do you yeah, want absolutely. To yeah, definitely. Um, I would say um, Santiago and Carmen would probably agree with me in saying that nonprofits are are certainly making a difference in the lives of communities. Um, every single day, right? Um, that's the commitment, that's the legacy, that's what we um, um, we intend to do and continue to do. So I would say 
a couple of things. Um, nonprofits have a huge opportunity to play a role in, um, you know, disrupting the systemic barriers for Latino young people and for young people of color as a whole. You know, Youth Leadership Institute's thinking about this from a middle school, high school, college age uh, perspective, where young people are figuring out what's the issue that's facing us right now in this rural community, in this suburban community, in this urban community, and how do we actually collect the data that helps inform our uh, school administrators, our principals, our city council members, our mayors, and they're sitting down with them and telling them, this is what we're seeing. Here's what the research says, and here's our recommendations for change, right? Like that is um, so important um, to the um, to the fabric of our work and to ensuring that young people are at the center of creating that change. So uh, we've, ju we've just been asked a great question um, and, and we're going to go around uh, one more time. We're going to, uh, we're going to uh, go to you, Carmen, and then Santiago, and we're going to end up with Patty. The question was, if you could change one thing, one thing, and I'm going to expand the question from not only one thing about your organization, but also one thing in this country to change this uh, systemic issue that has been referenced here a couple of times. What would that one thing be? Carmen, do you want to give, the, give that a cut? If you will we'll make you the, the all powerful uh, grand person who, can, who could just decide with a word of what change we have in this country, what change would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, there's so many different things that that we can take on. Um, but I think it's just really that access to equitable resources, right? Whether we're talking about our community and our community members having access to, um, you know, making those connections, knowing that they can be part of a larger, uh, a larger business development corporation if you're a small, you know, woman entrepreneur uh, for our families, knowing that if your child is having difficulties, academic difficulties, there's a whole host of services free and available uh, to you, right? So there's many different things, but as an organization, also from an organizational perspective, as nonprofits, I think COVID has really highlighted the fact that as, an, as nonprofits, we're still not seen as small businesses. We are small businesses. Uh, and some of us have bigger uh, budgets than other, except we don't get those resources. We don't get those supports. And so, you know, one of the things is we continue to provide services and we're all great at making it happen because I think that's just part of how we operate as Latinos, right? Like if there's a problem, we're going to find a solution to it. But at the same time, there needs to be greater support so that there's development, so that there's connection, so that there's more of these spaces where we're sharing, we're connecting. You know, Patty, uh, Patty talks about uh, the data, right? The data is a huge driver. Many of us don't have the resources to pay a researcher, to pay someone to gather that data. And we need that data if we're going to stay competitive and if we can, if we're if our plan is right to continue to grow our organizations to continue the reach uh, that we have and to continue to provide the support that our community members need so there's both micro and macro levels to really beginning to address um, you know i think we're headed in the right direction but there's still room for for us to get more support more resources more support, more engagement of the community. This question is going to get harder as we go around the room because we can't duplicate answers. So Santiago, what, what would your answer be uh, given yes. that Carmen has already uh, <laughs> staked out the high ground of resources? Yeah, I, I hope you guys don't hate me for this, but let me start with the macro level. I think at the national level, at least for the community we serve here and maybe because it's, you know, of the, the folks that we're serving, Nothing's more important to the Latino community, in my opinion, than immigration reform. And I think if we can get comprehensive immigration reform in the, in the country, then we can solve a lot of issues. There are a lot of resources that exist. It's just a lot of folks cannot access those resources because they're undocumented. And I guess I see that a lot in Georgia. Again, Georgia, remember, Georgia is a first generation Latino state. It's not like New York. I've worked in New York, right? And, it's not like other states. We have a large population here, maybe 50% of 
of the Latinos that are undocumented, right? So from my perspective, that, that would resolve a lot of issues. In terms of, of the nonprofits, you know, my opinion is there's too many of them and there's not enough impact, right? And so when, when and that's part of the, I think that when you saw the 50-50, that's part of it. You have a lot of nonprofits duplicating efforts and services and not enough collaboration and not enough partnership. And so it's really hard to move the needle, right? When you start measuring impact, to me, it's all about impact. If you're, it's not just about helping people to identify that there are jobs available. How many of those people actually got jobs, right? How many of those people did you actually help put into work? And so I think what I have seen through my 20 years of nonprofit experience is that we cannibalize each other a lot, you know, and we don't, we don't collaborate, we don't partner. And sometimes you have multiple nonprofits in the same area trying to do the same thing, going to the same donors. And I think that just really hurts us trying to have the impact that we have to have, right? It's all about scale. In order to have impact, you have to have COVID. What COVID taught us is the, the, the bigger nonprofits with infrastructure, you know, they were able to handle the, the CARES funding that came, you know, that we were able to give out to um, housing, uh, uh, prevention, preventing homelessness, the COVID testing, the COVID vaccines. I mean, you have to have that infrastructure to be able to do that, right? So that's just my opinion. And, and that's what I see. I think we need either more collaboration or a partnership, or we need more mergers within the nonprofit sector. So your answer is rationality, um, uh, deduplication, uh, and scale. And Patty, um, if you got to change one thing, what would you change? Uh, Patty, you're, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. Um, okay, great, sorry about that. I think from an organizational standpoint, um, I, I think in order to stay competitive as a nonprofit, and I think we want um, the folks that work at our nonprofits to reflect our communities. I think for me, if I can change one thing, is to think about resources in a different way to ensure that the staff that I have are able to have, uh, to buy the homes that they wanna buy, to, um, to help their children uh, attend the universities or the schools that they wanna attend, that my folks have um, retirement accounts um, that, that, are, that are healthy and that help them thrive. So for me, if I could change anything, I would redeploy resources to my current staff to ensure that they can continue to do this work, which continues to serve our community, um, which I think would be really, um, if I could change something, that's what I'd change. Um, and I think across our country, um, one thing I, I would change is, um, uh, I, I don't know uh, if this, is, um, if this makes sense, but I think that the purchasing power of communities of color is like no other purchasing power when we come together. Um, and so a part of me wants to amplify that purchasing power um, and help train our communities um, to see that our purchasing power, our money uh, collectively is, is much stronger as, as our voice is um, in communities to really shape and direct the direction um, that, that we wanna go in um, from the investments that we'd like to see in our communities um, to the policy changes we'd like to see in our communities. So it's something, you know, I would, I would amplify our purchasing power because I don't think we uh, take, take a look at that um, as strongly as I'd love us to. You know, the, this whole idea of self-empowerment is, is really part of the answer, right? I mean, Americans have always taken it upon themselves to analyze problems and find within their own communities the uh, wherewithal to solve them. I think that is what is on display here. And I wanna thank you for sharing the great work that you're all doing in your communities together and sometimes uh, separately, sometimes transgenerationally as a person who has benefited from uh, being an aspira, uh, aspirante, is that, is that yes. the correct? Yes, aspirante. <laughs> aspirante and, and now uh, leading the, the organization. So uh, Santiago uh, Marquez, CEO of the Latin American Association of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, Patty Barahona, uh, CEO of Youth Leadership Institute in San Francisco. And Carmen Diaz Malvido, uh, CEO of Aspira of New York. Thank you so much for sharing the great work that you do. Everybody stay safe, please mask up, and hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. And that is the Nonprofit Report. <laughs>